The Photographer by Mary Dixie Carter Chapter 1 I caught a glimpse of Amelia Straub through the front entry glass. Then the door swung open and I stepped inside. Delta, darling! Her large brown eyes landed on me with commitment. I'm so grateful you made it here in this. She gestured dramatically in the direction of the storm outside. This tempest! We'd only just met, but the warmth in her voice was that of a close friend. She assumed the best about me. If she had a test, I'd passed it. Behind her, a floating sculptural staircase, seemingly lit from above, with glass balustrades and bronze railings, ascended dramatically from the stair hall. A wide passage extended the length of the house so that even from the front door I could see a sparkling kitchen in the back and three sets of floor-to-ceiling glass and steel bifold doors that opened up to a deck and backyard. I'd found before and after pictures of the house online, a Greek revival brownstone in Borum Hill with an understated facade and an interior that Amelia and her husband Fritz had designed and transformed but the photos hardly did it justice. Casting my eyes about the house was like viewing a series of paintings, one more striking than the next. And, and of itself, the staircase was a work of art, and seen in the context of the home as a whole, it surpassed itself. Amelia hung my coat in a pristine hall closet next to a sleek purple down Moncler. I knew the price of that coat, over two thousand. Her long, slender arms danced gracefully up around her body while she told me in the most effusive terms how much she admired my work. She led me to the rear of the house where a group of well-dressed tween girls sat at a long farmhouse table in front of more than a dozen plastic containers of beads and chains. I recognized 11-year-old Natalie Straub in that group because she vaguely resembled her mother. The planes of her face, skin tone, posture, hair texture, and quality. These are the things that I notice. When photographing anyone who has a weakness in one of these areas, I compensate with lighting and angles. Natalie did not have a weakness per se, but neither did she have a particular strength. She was a tall girl who held her arms tightly to her sides, as if she didn't feel comfortable taking up too much space. In an otherwise bland appearance, I was relieved to see that she had sharp gray eyes. Try photographing a moron. It's next to impossible. What I'm always looking for is the sparkle in the eyes, the curiosity. If the subject of my photograph is not thinking or doing anything, the photograph comes out blank. A small girl on Natalie's right repeatedly swung her red hair over her shoulder one way and then the other. I overheard bits of the girls' conversation, mostly having to do with their recent Thanksgiving break. Montauk, one girl said. Insane traffic. Natalie had an oval face, fair, almost translucent skin, and nondescript dirty blonde hair. I could predict that her mother would take her to a colorist when she turned 13, or maybe even sooner. Most of the mothers I met touted their daughters' academic success, sports, music, art, what have you. They didn't think it seemingly to brag on their daughters' looks. Not to say that it didn't matter to them. They were hardwired to want pretty daughters. They really couldn't help it. I'd been working as a family photographer for almost a decade. I started off assisting on weddings, but my talent and skill in capturing children was impossible to ignore. People want me to photograph their children because in one photograph I'm able to give them the life they want to believe they already have. In most cases, they don't and they won't. But my photographs tell them the story they long for. 
In the kitchen, wide gleaming marble countertops and the wide backsplash contrasted with the dark wood accents on a cabinet cabinetry and the suspended glass cabinet hung from the high ceiling. A handsome man, whom I presume to be Fritz Straub, opened the fridge and took out two beers. He offered a second beer to a younger man with dark hair, perhaps a junior colleague, based on their body language. I pulled my camera out and shot a few photos of Fritz. In order to take good photos of anyone, I need to believe in that person's beauty. If I can't see it, then the camera won't see it, and no one else will be able to see it either. My subjects are always beautiful in my eyes. If they don't start out that way, I force my brain into contortions in order to see it that way. In Fritz's case, I didn't have to talk myself into believing he was handsome. He had sandy hair, a strong jaw, and green eyes so intense that the blaze through his glasses. At one moment, he appeared to be sharing some sensitive information. He lowered his voice and turned his body away from the room. He looked over his shoulder repeatedly to make sure no one was within earshot. I probably could have stood close enough to hear the conversation. For many people, I'm invisible, the same way a servant is. I'm performing a function and they don't take in the degree to which I see and hear what they say and do. That inconspicuousness usually benefits me. Years ago, I felt slighted in these instances, but over time, I've grown to appreciate them. Several minutes later, when Fritz became aware of my presence, I turned and walked from the dramatically high ceiling great room, which extended the width of the house in back through the media room and entered the library at the front of the house where Amelia was seated in front of a roaring fire, holding court amid a group of four girls. She shone down on them like the sun. In my experience, 11-year-old children are rarely drawn to, drawn to the adults in the room. They're usually drawn to each other. But Amelia had such a powerful presence that the standard rules didn't apply to her. It was practically impossible not to pay attention to her performance, partly because she seemed to expect that everyone would. Ingrid, we're so proud of you. Amelia spoke in a lilting voice. Natalie told us about your tennis championship. Ingrid's face colored and she giggled. Amelia placed her finger slightly on the child's face and brushed the hair away from her eyes. The semifinals? What an accomplishment! Objectively speaking, I was more attractive than Amelia was. I had larger breasts, a smaller waist, and fewer lines in my face. I was certainly younger by ten years at least. Amelia had chiseled cheekbones and deep-set eyes. Overall, her features were a little sharp, but striking nonetheless, and she had a remarkable magnetism, the kind of person to whom men and women alike gravitate. A wall of bookshelves at one end of the library stood in contrast to the pristine furniture glistening glass everywhere, a room that didn't suggest the presence of a child. Natalie appeared to have the self-control and restraint beyond her years. So I gather that she didn't pose a threat to her, at least not now. Perhaps she had learned the hard way. I wouldn't have been able to blend into the crowd so well if it weren't for my affluent high school boyfriend, son of an Orlando lawyer whom I dated for three years. I had the luxury of time in which to study his parents, his sister, and him individually and collectively. Even at 15, it was obvious to me that you need to immerse yourself in a lifestyle if you want to fit in, if you want people to believe that you belong to their world. It's a matter of osmosis. It turned out my boyfriend was a prick. He pulled a knife on me once. When I explained the nuances of the situation to his parents, they got me a full ride to the University of West Florida. It was the least they could do. 
if they wanted gratitude, they should have got me into Yale. My talent as a photographer is multidimensional. I'm a documentarian when called upon to be that. Of course, I can disappear into the woodwork and capture the interactions that naturally occur at a gathering among family and friends. But that sort of photography often leaves me unsatisfied. I like to create the moments. I see myself as a director. I reappeared in a dining area with my camera out several minutes later, followed by Itzhak, the Straubs' aged bloodhound, who wandered in and among the girls, eventually sidling up to Natalie. Absent-mindedly, she scratched them behind his ears. I began with discretion, asked the documentarian. From twenty feet away, I snapped photos of the girls. Natalie held herself in reserve much of the time. The others were presumably her friends, but she didn't seem to trust their friendship. Amelia might have misjudged how long they would spend on jewelry making because most of them finished their projects relatively quickly and soon looked bored. Natalie appeared self-conscious as if she felt responsible for entertaining the girls. Over the years, I'd learned that the children needed to be in a good mood or the photos would fail. I'd come up with ways to save unsuccessful parties and had become a particularly adept at party tricks, such as balloon animals and face painting. I always came equipped with a dual-action hand pump, balloons, face paint brushes, stencils. Once in a while, I chose to pull some of my supplies out. Only when I sensed the party going off the rails. Surprisingly, even so-called sophisticated children, as old as thirteen, found such things delightful. Balloons especially. They usually elicited gestures and facial expressions that suggested innocence and joy. In New York City, many children lost that early on. Jaded children made very poor photo subjects. Balloons gave me the best chance of capturing something that looked like happiness. Natalie said yes to the balloon animals. Responding to her friend's request, I made a unicorn, a giraffe, a cougar, a castle, a yacht, and a helicopter. The balloons worked. I got the shots of Natalie and her friends that I needed. Faces illuminated, energized, in media rest. Even the most constrained and constraining parents craved images of their child diving headfirst into the world without fear or inhibitions, living, experiencing. What they themselves had wanted to do but couldn't. Most of the time my raw material turned out well, and if all else failed, of course I could Photoshop. Toward the end of the party, Fritz gathered the girls around the dining table, and Amelia brought out a large birthday cake shaped and decorated like a cello and a bow and bow. Eyes on her daughter, Amelia beamed as she placed the cake in front of Natalie and knelt on the floor next to her daughter's chair. Amelia's posture, her tilted head, her soft smile were intended to convey extreme devotion to her daughter. Not that I considered her disingenuous, but I gathered that loving her daughter in front of witnesses helped cement a necessary self-image. The assembled girls sang to Natalie, crowding in to get a better look at the cake. And then Natalie blew out the candles. These are the most important shots. The cake, the song, blowing out the candles. If you miss them, there's no way to make up for it. They aren't going to happen twice. No other moments of the party come close to those in magnitude and weight. Ideally, I needed to capture both parents of their child when the cake is presented. The parents rarely acknowledge it, but they want to see themselves as much as they want to see their children. They want to see themselves being good parents. They want proof. This, that is what I provide. Fritz sliced the cake and handed it out to the little she-wolves. Then, like clockwork, the parents showed up and most of the children disappeared within ten minutes except for a few stragglers. I packed my camera case, found my coat, and was getting ready to follow, but Natalie stood in front of the doorway and blocked me. 
Delta, you said you'd make a balloon elephant. That's my favorite animal. Sorry, Natalie. If I were to stay later than we'd agreed, I'd be devaluing myself and my time. And I'd also risk being viewed as intrusive. In the past, I'd occasionally made the mistake of allowing myself to become friendly with a client, and it hadn't always ended well. But something about this family and this house was difficult to resist. The edifice itself, the rooms, the people, every aspect of it beckoned to me. Please! Natalie's wide eyes locked with mine.